Right. Thank you very much, Des. And, and thanks, everybody, for sparing the time to listen and watch. <clears throat> uh, and I'll start off by saying something I learned from uh, recently is just um, what a great organisation we have in the society. I, when uh, it was published that I was going to give this talk, one of our members, Ian Burns from Toronto in Canada, immediately contacted me and uh, sent me a whole lot of information about the um, the RAF in the Baltic that uh, he was collecting to, to one day write something, but has not never got around to it. I had a lot of the information, but... Uh... Oh, sorry, I've just muted you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you're I'm unmuted. Back. You're unmuted now. I'm so sorry. That's all right. I, um, yeah, Ian Burns uh, sent me a lot of information and some photographs. So I didn't have time to incorporate them in the talk, but I'm long-term plan to write a, a journal article and I'll certainly be including them then. So here we are, the, the Royal Air Force in the Eastern Baltic, 1919. The Great War officially ended in June, 1919, and the guns, we're often told, fell, fell silent in November, 1918, but various associated conflicts kept going well after that. And um, the biggest of those was the Russian Civil War, starting in, after the revolution of 1917. In fact, it's interesting that um, uh, as the guns were falling silent in France, almost exactly as they were falling silent in France, uh, Bolshevik artillery was shelling uh, Scottish and Canadian infantry, uh, Scottish and American infantry and Canadian artillery at a place called Tulgas on the Davina River in North Russia. So the, really the beginning of hostilities there. So let's see if I can move on. For some reason, the little arrow to move on has disappeared. Ah, okay. Oh, wait on, it's popped up. I can see it. It just turned up. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, I'll go on. Um, in 1919, the Allied nations were supporting the ultra Bolshevik forces as they fought the new revolutionary forces of Russia. As part of the contribution by the United Kingdom, Royal Air Force was involved in three theatres. In North Russia, uh, centred on Archangel, as part of the Slavo British Aviation Corps, which um, we've dealt with in, I've dealt with in a couple of articles in the journal. Also in South Russia, number 47 squadron, commanded by um, Raymond Collishaw, operated in support of General Denikin's army and 221 and 266 squadrons flew over the battlefields near the Caspian Sea. But in the Baltic, this is the smallest of the, the three interventions, as part of Admiral Cowan's fleet supporting the Baltic nations and anti-Bolshevik Russians. The primary role of the RAF in the Baltic was just to, was to provide aerial support for the Royal Navy. Just to see where we are. Uh, in 1919, the, the Eastern Baltic was the scene of fighting between the Bolsheviks and Reds, anti-Bolsheviks or Whites, plus new nations, Finland, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Now to complicate things, and it's a pretty complex situation that just to study the, um, uh, what was going on there, you've got red fins, white fins, uh, lots of separatist forces. And uh, to confuse things, the, the German Eighth Army was formerly based in, in Latvia and Lithuania. Um, under the terms of the armistice, Germany was responsible for maintaining control in occupied territory. The German government didn't really consider that the armistice applied to Eastern Europe as the governments of Russia and the Baltic nations were, weren't involved in the peace negotiations. The, um, the Allies didn't agree. As well as the German army, uh, there were Freikorps, Freikorps units, and they were um, sort of semi-private army units. They were seeking to maintain a wartime military life, defeat communism in Germany, expand German territory in the Baltic. Uh, supported by some aircraft in Lithuania and Latvia, but um, they didn't, didn't see any combat and um, by the time of our story, they'd rather uh, starting to fade away. Just a quick question, Gareth. Yes. Um, there were two VCs awarded to Australians. Is that in that general area there as well? Is it? No, I'm that was got... it in North Russia. Yeah, that's North in, Russia. Um, that. Yeah, on the, the okay. um, Archangel, based on Archangel. Right. Okay. Thank you very All much. Right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Gareth, one one more question. Yeah. 
Um, your, your map there on the previous page, I, I suppose we should point out that that's uh, post not in 45 frontiers. Yeah, that's right. That, that was the best I could do. <laughs> Good <one. laughs> yeah, and We will get to moving frontiers a little later too. Um, right, the, the Victoria, they decided to, uh, the Royal Navy would be responsible for maintaining peace in the Baltic. And it was codenamed Operation Red Trek, which seems a fairly modernish sort of name, but um, that's what they picked. And uh, the or original commander was Admiral Edwin Alexander Sinclair. And he vowed to attack the Bolsheviks as far as my guns can reach. And he was replaced by Admiral Cowan, who we see pictured there, in January 1919. Cowan was a Welshman. Uh, he was awarded the DSO for action in the Sudan, supporting Kitchener's forces there in 1898. And he led a force of cruisers and destroyers in, in the Eastern Baltic. And one of the, the, among the tasks facing the British was containing the Red Navy from Kronstadt near Petrograd. And just a note on Cowan, he was awarded a second DSO in North Africa in 1941, when he was 73. Um, he was probably the, the oldest serving, or uh, oldest British serviceman seeing active service during the Second World War. And <clears throat> now just um, the first RAF aircraft in the Baltic was probably the ship's camel carried on the light trouser HMS Caledon, which was Cowan's flagship, arrived in January 1919. And we see a photo of it taking off from a platform between the cruiser's funnels. <clears throat> in July 1919, the aircraft carrier, and when we say aircraft carrier, it was um, not an aircraft carrier as we would know it, where aircraft take off and land, it was really a ship that carried aircraft. Um, it was a converted cruiser and carried short 184 seaplanes, ships camels, ships strutters, and grain griffins, which we'll get to later. And there's another shot of, of Vindictive. Um, <clears throat> the problem with, with Vindictive, she, she ran aground in the Baltic on her way to um, when she was joining uh, Cowan's forces. And they had to unload some 2,000 tons of stores, had to be offloaded to lighten the ship. The, um, this was complicated by the fact that the, uh, the Baltic is tideless. So uh, fortunately, strong winds came along and uh, that helped them to tow it off the, the sandbank using uh, destroyers. I didn't know the Baltic was tideless. Yeah, that, so, so I discovered. <laughs> That's remarkable. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, she was commanded by uh, Captain Henry Grace, the son of English cricketer, Dr. W.G. Grace. <laughs> and only one person ever landed a, an aeroplane on Vindictive. It was a self with flop, pup flown by Captain Wavell Wakefield, 1st of November, 1918. He approached very slowly and um, a, a ground a handling party ran out and um, grabbed the aeroplane and pulled it down to the deck. He went on to play 31 internationals for, for England at a number as a number eight, and fairly successfully, won 20, drew three, lost eight, served as Secretary of State for Air. He also became president of the Rugby Football Union and eventually created Baron Wakefield of Kendall. And he was also a steam train enthusiast. So he, yeah, a man of considerable talent. The RAF contingent on uh, Vindictive was commanded by Major Graham Donald, David Graham, and he flew with the R RNAS in the Aegean and the UK. In 1914, he played rugby as a wing forward, now what we now call a flanker, for Scotland and um, in two losing matches. In the Second World War, he commanded RAF Maintenance Command. And there's a, a photo of him uh, when he was playing for Oxford. You can see him um, third from the right and the, the front row. And by coincidence, he also flew a ship strutter off HMAS Australia in December 1917. And if you look closely, you can see the, the strutter's cowling has been removed to assist cooling. Right. <coughs> Kronstadt. The, major, the, the uh, Red Fleet was, was based in Kronstadt near Petrograd. We can just, there's an arrow pointing to where it is. 
and uh, it was well known. It, they had submarines and surface ships there. It had been a, a Royal Navy submarine base during the, the Great War, as were um, other bases. Helsinki, or was then called Helsingfors, and Tallinn were also uh, Royal Navy bases. The, um, after the, the Treaty of brest litovsk which um, pulled Russia out of the war, uh, the British scuttled eight submarines just off the, um, the harbour at Helsinki. At Helsinki, and they're, they're still there as far as I know. Uh, the aircraft from Vindictive was based at Coivisto, a primitive aircraft that airfield they hacked out of the, um, uh, the, the forest there, while the, uh, the seaplanes operated from Bjorko Sound, then in, which was then in Finland. So the, the, the camels patrolled for enemy aircraft without finding any, and the short 184 was searched for submarines. <clears throat> Well, we've got an idea of where they are. The, the two little dots, I don't know if you can see them, they're um, uh, near Primorsk. And um, unfortunately, this, this photo sort of suggests that um, Kronstadt is, is part of the land, but it's, it's an island. But the, um, for some reason, the, the photo seems to suggest that the shallow water is, um, uh, is land. And Gareth, um, right, right. St. Petersburg or Petrograd was to the east of there. To the east of, yes. Yeah. Just, just off screen to the right. Just to the off right. screen to the right, yeah. yeah. Right, the short, we'll go through the aircraft that the RAF had. Short 1A4s used for anti submarine patrols, and they bombed a Bolshevik ships encountered. Um, but they couldn't climb above 4,000 feet which put them well within range of anti-aircraft fire, as well as machine guns and rifles, which was um, rather uncomfortable. Ship's camels, a little bit smaller than the, um, the F1 camel. I think uh, the wingspan's 26 foot 11, compared to an F1 camel's 28 foot, and the uh, fuselage is about three inches shorter. They, they featured attachable fuselage just after the cockpit, and the armament differed you can see it's got a Lewis gun above the upper wing and just one Vickers gun. Ship strata, slightly lighter fittings than the, um, uh, the land-based strata. And they were often flew from, um, as we saw with that photo of HMAS Australia, flew off from um, platforms on above gun turrets. And there's one doing that very thing. And they used them for reconnaissance and bombing. The Grain Griffin <coughs> was based originally on the, um, the Sopwith B1, which was one of the lesser known Sopwith aircraft. They only built one. Um, neither the, um, <coughs> the British or the French were interested in it. And um, so it was transferred to the RNAS at experimental station at Port Victoria, where on the Isle of Grain where uh, it was redesigned and uh, emerged as the Grain Griffin. Only, five, only seven were built. Five of them were, were fitted with um, inline engines and the rest with the, the Bentley BR2, the engine of the power of the sort of snipe. And the aircraft on, on the right is actually on Vindictive. So we've got some photos here of uh, Coy Visto, the, um, the aerodrome they built. You can see uh, it was about 20 minutes flying time from, from Kronstadt. The, uh, they patrolled for red aircraft, but none were seen. The Workers and Peasants Air Fleet operated a motley collection of aircraft from the former Imperial Aerodrome at Bogachina. But they, they've had one, one raid on um, naval bases, but uh, that was all. The, um, the Workers and Peasants Air Fleet had a bit of a problem with um, a lot of offensive flying that. Uh, their pilots were former Imperial um, Russian pilots. And there was a worry that um, if they flew away, they would defect. And quite reasonable um, thought as a lot of them did. So um, they tend to keep their airplanes on the ground. It's interesting to look at that. You can see most of the, um, the personnel or the close are wearing, still wearing their Royal Naval Air Service uniforms, but, um, or Naval uniforms. But there's a man just next to the camel with the checkerboard um, cowling who's wearing Royal Flying Corps khaki. Um, 
<clears throat> but I think no one took their best uniforms to Russia. There's another couple of photos of camels at Chloe Vista. Now, <clears throat> this is also germane to the story, coastal motorboats. The uh, Royal Navy operated these high-speed motorboats from a base um, at, at uh, I've forgotten his name, Terioki, um, in Finland, close to Petrograd. And they used those to, um, to run supplies and, um, and, and spies into Petrograd. And they're armed with a torpedo, but the tricky thing with the torpedo is it's released backwards. So uh, you, you aim the, um, the, the boat at the target, fire the torpedo out backwards, then quickly turn out of the way before the uh, torpedo starts running. But the great thing about the CMPs, they're very slow draft. They, they could pass over the minefields and they could also pass over cables that were laid, or if that's the term, um, just below the surface of the water to, uh, to stop surface vessels from, from operating. <clears throat> Incidentally, the, the, uh, the CMPs were based at uh, yeah, Terioki and it was then in Finland, now it's in Russia. And uh, it was the site of the, originally the St. Petersburg Yacht Club, which claims to be the oldest yacht club in the world. Um, <clears throat> in June, a CMB commanded by a Lieutenant Agar torpedoed and sank the, this cruiser, the Oleg, while it was ship shelling Estonian ground forces fighting the Red Army. Um, Oleg was, Oleg Agar was a pilot, but didn't serve in the RNAS. And he was awarded the secret Victoria Cross. It was called that because um, no details were announced of a where and when. Um, the, the deed had been done. Um, it was British government really couldn't decide whether what the situation was in Russia. Were they um, at war with with the Soviets or not? And it was eventually decided they were in a state of war, but weren't actually at war, which must mean something to, to someone. But um, very little if you were um, you were actually there fighting. Right, the, uh, the, the small CMBs were, were then replaced by these much larger CMBs with, with two torpedoes and uh, again released backwards. And they again used a bit for running secret agents in and out of Petrograd. If you, um, you're interested, there's a fellow called Paul Dukes who's worth looking up. He's the, the only man to have been awarded, to have been knighted for services as a secret agent. And right, there's Kronstadt, and that was the. It's still a, a Soviet naval base. It's been it was established by the Peter the Great in 1703. Um, it was very strongly Bolshevik. It was one of the reasons, or among among the many reasons, that uh, Petrograd swung in with the uh, uh, the revolution. And based in there, and you can see in that area down the bottom, the sort of bottom right is the, the, the naval harbour and the um, battleships and, uh, and submarines were based Hello. in there. Hello? Right, and those little islands you can see off the, um, the south coast there were fortified with um, searchlights and machine guns and anti-aircraft artillery. <clears throat> Right, Operation DB. In J July, the, the RF began bombing Kronstadt, and um, there was support for a, um, a short-lived mutiny of Red Troops who decided to, they didn't want to be Red Troops anymore, and um, they were suppressed by, by fire from Kronstadt, but they, fired, they raised 11 aircraft, which was all the pilots that they had, five 184s, three Camels, two Stratus and a Griffin, using all the available parts, bomb ships at Kronstadt first light on the 30th of July. And they named the, the, the raid Operation DB after Admiral David Beatty. They dropped 10 112 pound bombs, six 55 pound bombs, and caused some damage. It was, always, it was a, a big effort for the, um, the RAF that was there at the time. The, um, the, 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 the 184s had no trouble taking off, but the, um, that the, aer the aerodrome at Kroist Vista wasn't long enough for the fully laden um, 
strutters and uh, the grain griffin to take off. They had to take off from Vindictive, but um, when they returned, having dropped their bombs, they were able to land at Corvisto. Right, August was, was an active time. Uh, the first fatality crashed at Corvisto just after takeoff, killed the pilot, and a Griffin bomb crunched out after the pilot switched off the engine at 8,000 feet, diving with the sun behind him, then started the engine as he zoomed over the, the base and bombed a building which caught fire. The, um, the Grain Griffin there is one of the very early ones with an inline engine. Um, the, one of the things they tried to do was um, keep the Bolshevik uh, observation balloons on the ground because um, that they could keep a, an eye on, on British ships that are approaching the area um, and forming a, a threat to the Red Navy. Uh, but usually the Bolsheviks could, could haul the boat balloons down before they could be burst. Grain Griffin in the sea. One of them was forced down in the Baltic, saved by a tug from the minesweeper Larkspur. Interesting markings on the, um, the side of the griffin. Unfortunately, we can't, can't really make out what they are. Oh, good. Uh, and another couple of photos of a, a ditched aircraft being saved. But in 1919, the, the grand plan was that uh, following the supply of equipment by the British, including tanks and their crews, the anti-Bolshevik Northwestern Army led by General Nikolai Udenich was preparing to advance on and hopefully capture Petrograd. And they were worried about uh, what the white troops being shelled by um, the red warships, especially battleships, while moving along the coast and adjacent areas. Uh, among the, um, the British troops serving with them, um, uh, the, the Northwestern Army and the, the Estonians who were, were next to them was the man who became Field Marshal Sir Harold Alexander, who was then a, a colonel in the Irish Guards. Is he the fellow with the moustache there? No, that's uh, Udenich. Oh, right. He was the um, <coughs> the commander. He was apparently not a, not a terribly good uh, general, uh, as was the case with most of the white generals. Uh, the, the whites had a problem that... Um, well, the Reds knew what they were fighting for, but the, um, the Whites, it was more a case of what they were fighting against. And um, not sure if it's true, but uh, I read somewhere that uh, when the, the final assault on Petrograd, the, the tanks couldn't operate because um, they'd been sabotaged with sugar in the petrol tanks. Because the, um, a lot of Udenich's men thought that uh, the Petrograd uh, should fall to Russians, not to... Um, Russians helped by British. So, uh, right, uh, among the, the, the problems or well, the threats from Kronstadt is the battleship Andrei Perver, uh, the, the, this battleship. And the little arrow keeps disappearing. Right. And uh, Petropavlovsk, which is another one. Here it's seen uh, in the harbour at um, what was then Helsingfors, now Helsinki in 1916 as part of the Imperial Russian engine. So they were, they were the, the real threats that, that these two battleships could shell the white Russians and Estonians. Also, there was um, the submarine depot ship Pamyat Azova. Um, it was originally named the Azova and um, a ship with a distinct, uh, it was named after a ship with a distinguished record in the 19th century. But the title was stripped by the Tsar after a mutiny during the, um, the Russo-Japanese War. And it was renamed Divina. But when the Bolsheviks took over, they, they gave it its old title back. Looks pretty, pretty old and decrepit, but um, it apparently was a, an effective submarine depot ship. And also submarines. There, there's one, it's two of them side next to the Pamir Azova, and on the right is the Pantera. Um, well-known Russian submarine, and apparently the only submarine, or only Russian submarine, to have been bombed by a Zeppelin. And I've, I'm still looking for details on exactly when that's supposed to have happened. 
Uh, also, the cruiser Rurik was also another ship that was seen as a threat to the to the whites. And uh, also at Kronstadt is the um, the cruiser Aurora, which um, you may recall a blank round from Aurora was the signal to storm the Winter Palace, you know, kicking off the October Revolution. Um, she was a, she's a veteran of the Russo-Japanese War. In fact, it survived the, the Battle of Tsushima, which not many Russian ships did. And um, it's, it's still serving. It's, it's the flagship of the Russian Navy. And uh, it was restored uh, late last century. It was discovered a lot of it was actually made in Britain and shipped out to, off to Russia to be incorporated in the, in the ship. But she was just being virtually being stored at uh, Kronstadt. There's a, another photo of Kronstadt, a modern one. Um, you can see the, um, there's a very narrow gap to, to get into the harbour down, down the bottom there. And uh, at the time, the, the, uh, the two battleships were moored uh, near the, the, the seawall at the, the southern end of the, um, uh, the harbour. And the submarine depot ship was just about straight in front of, um, of the little, the narrow opening. Right, Operation RK. So Admiral Cowan decided that um, the thing to do was to, to neutralize the, the Russian fleet. And that by CMVs entering at night via that very narrow entrance, torpedo the major ships. It would take place in the morning, early hours of 18 August. It was named Operation RK after Admiral Sir Roger Keyes, planner of the April 19 Zeebrugge raid. Meantime, the, the RAF was charged with flying at low level bombing and machine gunning attacking on the defences to avert attention from the CMBs. Um, so they were going to use four short 184s, two strutters, a camel, and one grain griffin. The, um, the, the, uh, thanks to, to various raids by the RAF, the um, the defences at Kronstadt tended not to switch on their searchlights, which was was good, because the um, uh, the aircraft would, would simply attack the searchlights. So that that was the idea was to to make sure they kept doing that and, and didn't switch them on to look for the CMBs. So <clears throat> on the morning of the day before, a Strata flew over to Kronstadt, photographed the current locations of the ships, and uh, two of the CMB skippers were flown over. It was the first flight for both of them. So, right, the first at the aircraft left Covisto and Bujorko Sound at around one o'clock. Major Donald flew one of the 184s. The, the camel was, fly, was piloted by this man, Scotsman Arthur Randall, uh, credited with two victories while flying DH2s in early 1917 with the 32 squadron. Eight victories from SE5As in 85 squadron in 1918. He suffered engine problems on the way to Kronstadt and was nearly forced to ditch in the Baltic, but fortunately his engine picked up and he was able to continue. Um, he was actually dismissed from the RAF after a general court martial in 1926. He moved to Dominica where he lived until he died in 1948. Um, one of the strutters was flown by this man, Captain Thomas Williams, DFC, uh, MC DFC, Englishman who had served in the South African in Infantry, uh, credited with nine victories flying camels for 65 Squadron, and retired in 1952, serving as Inspector General of the RAF. Two others, Captain Winf Wilfred Ackland and uh, Lieutenant Eric Brewerton. Um, Wing, Wing Commander Ackland was killed in the crash of an Imperial Airways Short Empire flying boat in Athens Harbour in 1937. So there they are on their way to, to Kronstadt. And you can see the, um, the route they took there to uh, avoid, well, they, they flew the same, the same track as the, uh, the CMBs, avoiding the island forts, minefields and guard ships. Ah, that didn't turn out. I had a photo of um, the entrance to Kronstadt, a uh, modern one with R the Russian Navy sailing, or part of the Russian Navy sailing past it. But um, 
for some reason it's um, it's disappeared. These things happen. All right. Also, guarding Constant was this the destroyer Gavriel, which was patrolling up and down outside the harbour entrance. So <clears throat> at 1:30, the um, the, air, the eight attacking aircraft began bombing and machine gunning the Bolshevik defences, concentrating on gun positions and searchlights. The destroyer depot ship was, they claimed that they damaged just by aerial bombs, but um, apparently not. The pilots have been instructed to keep flying low over the red positions, even after their ammunition was exhausted. While the defenders were occupied by the aerial assault, CMBs were able to enter the harbour and through that little gap and begin their attack. Torpedoes were launched at both battleships and the depot ship. Two CMBs co collided in the, the harbour and others were damaged by defensive fire. So this man, Captain Albert Fletcher, AFC, uh, he saw that the, a searchlight had, from one of the islands had picked up uh, one of the C, a damaged CMB while it was being taken in tow. But um, he, he attacked the, the fort, firing his Vickers gun, where his observer fired his Lewis gun, and he dived down the beam of the searchlight until his fire called the, the, the light to fail. And uh, thanks to the, his efforts, the CMBs were able to, to escape. Um, he commanded a torpedo training unit in World War II and he retired due to ill health in 1941. There's a, this is the photo taken on the, um, the, the day before the, the, the raid and superimposed on it is the, the tracks of the CMBs. So you can see the, the two battleships over there on the right, and the um, Azov, the, the submarine depot ship, just about in the middle of the picture. Uh, and also see it's a very small area to be um, maneuvering at high speed and firing torpedoes at the back of your, your CMB. So <clears throat> the Pamir at Azov was sunk by the torpedo, by a torpedo. Um, Andre Perez was torpedoed and damaged moved to a dry dock, but never fully repaired. The Petro Pravlosk was thought to be sunk by a torpedo, but apparently unscathed. It was refitted and renamed the Marat in the 1920s. It was sunk by the Luftwaffe in 1941. I think it was um, uh, Hans Rudel, the, um, the Stuka pilot, was, the, was at least credited with sinking it. But uh, even, even though it was sank and sat on the, the bottom of the harbour, the guns were still operational and they um, uh, they played a part in the defence of then Leningrad. Right, CM, three CMBs were lost, eight personnel about were killed, and nine captured. Two CMBs skippers were roared the Victoria Cross. Um, for the RAF, only Captain Ca Randall's camel was crashed on a beach near Finland. He wasn't hurt, and uh, the other aircraft all returned safely. There's a photo of the um, Pamiat Azova wrecked by a, a torpedo. Interesting, the airmen who took part in the raid were awarded 64 pound, 15 shillings and five pence as a share of prize money, which sounds very 19th century, but um, yeah, they were in, apparently entitled to it. So they, they were paid it. The, um, the raid didn't, didn't, I'll just put this one in to show that um, uh, the Red Navy wasn't stopped by the, the raid on Kronstadt. The, um, this destroyer was sunk by Pantera, 31st of August, 1918. So within two weeks, the, the, the Red Navy was still out there and active. HMS Furious arrived in September, uh, bringing new airmen and aircraft, but it turned out all the aircraft were war weary and unusable. There was a theory that um, uh, depots in Britain had been told to send uh, airplanes to Russia. So um, they got the ones they didn't want put them on Furious and off they went. But among the pilots who arrived was Lieutenant Douglas Cully, Stuart Douglas Cully, the Canadian who downed um, Zeppelin L-53 in August 1918 when flying a camel, that ship's camel, from a barge towed by a destroyer. Um, that, that camel is um, uh, now preserved in the Imperial War Museum in London. Cully was a, a pretty busy man. 
um, there's what he did in October, just as an example of, of what the RAF was was doing in North in uh, the Baltic. Bombed a, a, a bat, battleship in dry dock. Bombed a railway station near Petrograd. Bombed a, a, a fort, Krasnaya of Gorka, machine gun a Bolshevik fort. Bombed fort number five at Kronstadt. Bombed a Bolshevik destroyer. Bombed the Krasnaya of Gorka, which I think is Red Hill in, in Russian, and attacked a kite balloon. Bombed the same place again, attacked another kite balloon. Bombed a machine gun a Bolshevik destroyer. So he was certainly an active man, he wasn't bored. All right, in September, uh, they kept patrolling for ships and submarines and kept bombing Kronstadt by day and night. 70 bombs were, but um, 70 bombs were dropped. Red Henry aircraft fire became more accurate. The pilots at the time thought that the, um, the gunners were Germans. They obviously didn't credit the, the Reds with being able to, um, to, to be accurate anti-aircraft gunners. And a camel and a strata fell victim to ground fire. In October, the, the weather was getting colder. The shorts kept their, their flights up, including and they one flight where two seaplanes fought a red destroyer during a snowstorm. Uh, they kept bombing Kronstadt and the forts that blocked the left flank of the um, of the White Russian Army advancing on Petrograd. The, um, the, the, the whites actually got to the suburbs of Petrograd, but um, that was as far as they got. And they kept bombing forts. Another camel was shot down, and um, the pilot was killed. And a short 184 was shot down, but an Estonian destroyer managed to rescue the crew. And that's a, a 25 pound Cooper bomb. In November, things were really getting cold. Daytime temperatures dropped between minus three and minus nine, freezing engines and other equipment. Uh, Coy Visto became unusable with, with several feet of snow on it. So the aircraft couldn't, could neither take off nor land. So it was evacuated on the 25th of November. Seaplane operations continued until 11 December when uh, Red Navy was confined to, to Kronstadt. The other problem with the cold weather, <coughs> with the short 184s is when they took off, of course, they kicked up a lot of spray, um, which uh, landed on the, around the tail and on the control wires and promptly froze, um, making control very difficult. So the, um, yeah, they had to fly around hoping that the, um, the ice would eventually melt. So it, it wasn't suitable flying conditions at all. So after 11 de December, Vindictive left the Baltic. So in the five months that they were there, 837 flying hours, were, operational hours were flown. 33 aircraft were lost, which is quite considerable. Three shot down, nine force landed in the sea. Seven crashed while taking off or landing. 14 were damaged before beyond repair by the climate. Four pilots, one ground crew member died and two pilots were wounded. But um, after they left, ship's camels were still around. You can see one in, in Estonian markings on the left and one in Latvian markings on the right. So that was the RAF in the Baltic. Right, Des, you don't. Oh, thank, thank you, Gareth. Thank oh. you. Thank you very much. Now, does somebody, does anybody have any questions? Of, uh... <laughs> unmute, unmute yourself if you'd like to. Hello, Gareth. It's Paul. Yeah. That, was, that was a very interesting presentation with so many resonances with today. Um, did the RAF yeah, operate? Surprising how people, they, they didn't want to be part of the workers' paradise. <laughs> did the RAF operate at squadron level and do you have some numbers and secondly were the Vindictive and the Furious transport vessels and all of the they were land-based aircraft just took off and flew to Cavisto and operated from there is that right yes they, uh, um, you could take off from from uh, uh, well all the aircraft were RAF, although they're on a Royal Navy ship. When the RNAS and the RAF, RFC were amalgamated, all the all the airplanes became RAF. Um, but they no, that wasn't nominated a squadron. They were just the aircraft on HMS Vindictive. HMS Vindictive. 
Um, they yeah, and they 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 took off from um, from a carrier, and uh, they they either landed on land or in the sea, as we saw with that uh, grain griffin. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Gareth, I've got a quick question. Oh, can you hear yeah. me? Yes, I can, yes. Here Sorry, can. Gareth. Yeah. I was looking at the um, one of the Russian ships. Uh, I can't remember the name, I'm sorry, but the flag on the bow almost looked like a British flag, but it couldn't possibly have been. No, it's an it's Imperial Russian flag. Ah, right, thank you. Yeah. I was just curious. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's actually red with, um, uh, red with a blue cross. Right, yeah. Mm. Estonia and Latvia navies also operated with a similar looking standard that looks yeah. like a Union Jack. Doesn't yeah, it I just, think, yeah. Uh, mm. uh, they were very, um, very grateful for the work of the Royal Navy. And um, I think uh, on one of the books, um, Freeing the Baltic, I think it is, uh, it says there's a plaque in a cathedral in um, uh, the Estonian capital, Tallinn, I think, um, saying in eternal Gratitude to the Royal Navy, 1919, and that <clears throat> both the Latvians and um, Estonians based their naval ensigns on the um, the Union Jack. Right, mm. that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, I, I just have a comment. Can you hear me okay? Yes, certainly. Yeah, um, I think it was the last photo you showed showing uh, the camels that have been passed over to the. Latvian and Estonian Air Forces, I think it was the Latvian one, it was actually decorated with a swastika. Now, presumably the swastika back in 1919 didn't have the nasty associations it got later on. I'm wondering whether you can shed any light on why the Latvians adopted the swastika back then. Uh, I think it was, well, it's, it's actually a, an old Hindu symbol um, it was there. It was a Latvian, yeah, a Latvian symbol. The um, symbol at the time, the um, the Finns also used a swastika, uh, a pale blue one, on their aircraft. So yeah. it was a yeah pre pre, pre the um, the Nazis. It was a um, a common symbol. And also, too, Gareth, it was slightly different. The Finns and the Latvians, they had the the cross arms, they were vertical and horizontal, whereas the Nazis, they were at an angle. Yeah, so the, the, um, uh, more, uh, the Latvian one was, was at an angle, but uh, it was, a, was, um, it? It was a, a dark maroon colour, sort of blood red, a dark colour of dried blood, I suppose. Well, well, it is the colour of dried blood. It, uh, going back in Latvian history, I used to work with a Latvian. Um, <clears throat> there, there was a Latvian army or whatever wearing white uniforms and after a battle were, were blood stained uh, their uniforms were were dark red except for the white where their, their belts had been um, hence the, the Latvian symbol of um, uh, their, their flag now is maroon white maroon right. I noticed that those um, um, I think those uh, swastika like symbols were around the other way from the way the Nazis used it I, I think, but yeah. also um, there's a DH4 that is sometimes appears in photographs, an, an RFC DH4 that sometimes appears in photographs with a reverse um, swastika <laughs> on its fuselage. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a common good luck. Uh, um, if you go to, I think, uh, what used to be Customs House in Circular Quay, uh, in, in laid in the floor, a little brass, swast brass swastikas. <laughs> They're, they're a good luck symbol in the 19th century. <laughs> there we are. Uh, go all here again. Yeah. How do you think the Royal Navy rated the employment of the Royal Air Force off its <laughs> ships and from its shifts in the Baltic operations and whether that was one of the issues that convinced them that they needed to retain a fleet air arm in the subsequent years. Did it work well for the Navy to do that? I think, yeah, the, the Navy right. are very appreciative of um, uh, the RAF's role in the Kronstadt raid and then also in patrolling for submarines, the things that they couldn't do. Um, so, I think, yeah, I think, it, and not all, well, we, we saw that um, 
two of the pilots on the raid uh, were ex-RFC, but a, a lot of them were, most of the pilots, I think, were ex-Royal Naval Air Service. So, <clears throat> yeah, they would have probably regarded them as um, as they would have the, the Royal Naval Air Service. But, yeah, they, they certainly appreciate what they did. Right. Any other questions? Well, look, I might just uh, wind up here and say thank you. Thank you oh, very much, yeah. Gareth. Yeah, very good. Um, a very good talk and um, <laughs> on an unusual oh, oh, episode yeah. of history, honestly. Yeah. It's, um, and also, um, thank you for, you know, enlightening about the rugby history of those yeah. involved. <laughs> and, and also, to be fair, you know, their, their, their subsequent um, history, all of which was, um, uh, you know, fascinating. They went, they went on to, um, you know, bigger and better things. It was amazing, uh, the, um, the, the background for these people. And um, so thank you very much. And um, I should say also that this talk will be uh, available uh, on the, um, via the Society's Facebook page in a couple of weeks' time, if you want to refer to anything in it. Uh, but um, just uh, it's remarkable to have that unusual piece of history, uh, uh, particularly at this rather difficult time. Mm. Yes. Yes. There's a, I've, I was recently given a very interesting book that covers the formation of the RAF. It's called The Birth of the World's First Air, Air Force, RAF, right. by Richard Overy. Richard oh. Over. Overy, O V E R Y. All right, yeah. Okay. It's very a very interesting book. It goes right into the, if you can see it there. Yeah, yeah. It goes right into the politics involved. Oh yes. Yeah, it's very interesting in that in that respect. It's amazing how much politics are involved. Yes, I think the RNAS were very jealous of them. Um, they were very. Very jealous of, of, of their service, yes. And of course, lots of Australians served in the RNAS, quite uh, our two top top aces served in the Little, little yeah. one of them. Little and um, yeah. Dallas. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Okay, well, look. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I meant to mention it, it that I, I, <laughs> I don't know. It's um, one of the problems that they, also the Royal Navy had in um, the Baltic was. Um, a lot of the uh, uh, the crews of the ships had joined were were, were hostility, hostilities only, and they they joined up to fight Germans, and um, suddenly finding themselves in the the Baltic fighting Russians was wasn't wasn't what they uh, had in mind. Yeah. So there were there were, they were um, not mutinies, but uh, certainly disaffected uh, sailors. I'm not sure about the the pilots. I think they were volunteers. But um, uh, yeah, not sure. Why did they get prize money? Do you mind me? I'm sorry. Uh, well, uh, that was the, the deal in, in the 19th century, where if you you sunk an enemy ship or you captured an enemy ship, um, oh, you're awarded a prize, <laughs> a financial prize. So, <laughs> so, so some some uh, habits die hard. <laughs> I think uh, prize money was still being awarded during the Second World War, believe it or not, although uh, right. not to individuals. It used to go to the uh, General uh, Benevolent Fund involved. So uh, it really wasn't uh, cancelled by the Royal Navy until after the Second World War. That's bizarre. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> in 2021, when Her Majesty's ship Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier went and flew combat missions over Syria, they had on board 617 Squadron Royal Air Force. So that teamwork between the services, and I might say the US Marine Corps, who also had a squadron on board, um, echoes again with what uh, was being done on board the Vindictive and the Flexible in 1918-19. Well, you are. But at least they, when they landed on the, on the carriers, they didn't have a, have a party run out and grab the aeroplanes and <laughs> pull <Yes>. them down. <laughs> when, the, when the Russians sent their aircraft carrier, the Knutsov, I think it is, for Syrian operations, the thing bro broke down and they found that their fixed-wing aircraft couldn't fly. 
properly from the deck. So they shifted all of their combat aircraft onshore to uh, yeah. a big air base in Syria, just like the, the British had to do mm. with their aircraft in 1918-19. Well, well, well. Uh, interesting times. Gareth, a, a quick question, if I may, sorry to be a late question. Did I see you said there was a 266 Squadron uh, in one of the early slides? Yeah, in uh, the, I've read uh, short 184s in the Caspian. Okay. Caspian, so. Could somebody just remind me, was that Biggles Squadron? It was, yes. Yeah, so okay. yeah, I've I, I wondered that too. Did um, W.E. Johns know about there really was a, a 266? <laughs> Thank you. It, it, you know, it wasn't a well-known one. <laughs> well, we've got Biggles involved. <laughs> oh, no. Don't we always? <laughs> All right. Well, look, we might finish up then. Gareth, oh, Gareth's had a long day. I've, I've got one more, one oh, more yeah. comment, if I could. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just, Gareth, uh, you mentioned Admiral Sinclair at the very start. He, he started off the expedition and then, then moved elsewhere. Hmm. Do you know that he moved to be Director of Naval Intelligence? No. I... Yeah, and he later then uh, established the Special Intelligence Service, which is now known to us as MI6. Oh, right. Yeah, so he's quite a wow. famous figure in intelligence uh, history right. later on. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to see, uh, to, to discover what people went on to do. Yes. Or, or, or yes. How, how familiar names crop up. <laughs> and that's uh, really, that led me to this. I, I came across mention of, um, of Donald um, from a rugby sense. And I thought, I'd know that name. And um, yeah, that's where it, it continued. And then Wavell Wakefield, um, a very well-known name in, in rugby circles. Hmm. Yeah. Is, is that the next book, Gareth? No, no. Rug, rug, <laughs> I, will be, I will be writing an article about uh, this for the journal. But uh, as I said, um, Ian Byrne sent me a, a pile of stuff that I, I'm still getting through. Oh, isn't that good? Yeah. yeah. All right, well, look, you've had a very big day. I think we probably should finish up. Very well. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Gareth. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you, Gareth. Gareth. Okay. Good. All right. <laughs> All right. I'll close down. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for attending. Thank you for attending. Bye. Bye.